between Europe and Asia and so on, depending which commercial risk rating agency to the line. So I put like 50 to 60, but just to to, to suggest um, how, how, how these can be uh, shown. The, um, the height of the column is the level of governance, is determined by like minus 2.5 plus 2.5, that's a range, maximum and minimum. Um, in, in standard deviation units, we will determine them. Um, but associated with each column, you see a thin line at the top that's kind of the margin of error. So that means the good, the, the bad news, quote unquote, the sober news is that uh, one ought not try to run the precise horse races and pretend that one, <coughs> that, that Sweden is better than, than Finland, basically. This is a statistical type because it's within the margin of error, or New Zealand, and so on. They're all in the same group. Um, that that uh, action basically segment the world into different categories, five, six different categories, where they are significantly, substantially different from the others. The green is being different than the yellows, the yellow, yellows different than the other, other color. By the way, Turkey comes out. The here we will get back to that that issue. They are very far from the countries in, in huge governance crises like the Somalias and Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, Iraq, Angola, Venezuela, and, 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 and so on. Another way of looking at the data is through a governance map. In this, in this case, it's a different. Um, different dimension, we put rule of law. If it looks to you as a cut and paste from the web, it is, because it's all from the website and one goes to the governance map and, and you can do it. And one of the things that's disturbing clear when one does this exercise with maps is the enormous variance um, in, in governance around the world, but even within the same, um, within the same continent, if we take my own country, and you can tell I'm biased, and I'm from Chile, um, you have the whole spectrum within one continent between a green country, meaning that they are in the, in the top group in terms of governance, control of corruption, very much like the, the better countries in OECD, in Europe, and so on, um, all the way to the Venezuelas and so on, which are in red. So this whole notion we are so used about reading and writing, which is to generalize about continents, it can be basically challenged very much when one looks carefully at the data because you have had such enormous variation. So in Africa, control of corruption, we have green too. Of course, we have many countries in crisis there <coughs> in Central Africa, but there is green. And if one starts looking and inching towards Europe, not everything is it's very green, like you can tell which country it is. But I'm not going to get into the details. But uh, anyway, the same about the Middle East, we see lots of challenges and, and differences. This is another way of, again, showing the data just to show a bit <coughs> more focus for some countries and groups of countries. So obviously, the Nordics lead the world by example in terms of all governance dimensions. It is not the US, contrary to, to believe, are not the main superpower who necessarily exhibit the best, they are the best models in terms of governance. US usually is about number 20 to 30 in the world in, in terms of many of these indicators. They vary depending on which one, but in terms of control of corruption, it would, it would not be so. Here it is. So here, it's like Turkey, it's where Brazil is. The difference is not statistically uh, very significant. A bit below the, the new European, recent other European countries have accessed from Eastern Europe in, in, part, in particular. They are much better, obviously, than, than China and, and Russia and like the Venezuela of this world. But then there are others, and the Nordics are at a different level altogether. Now you may say, well, this is kind of interesting and so on, but how do you know that this matters? So this is interesting data. Does it really matter? And we've done quite a bit of work 
And by now, it's not just us, other academic, about the extent, from an empirical standpoint, with a lot of data, the extent to which institutions and governments does matter for all kinds of economic uh, results. One very basic result, and I'm, I'm showing it in a very simplistic fashion, but we have done the, the peer review research, peer review papers and so on, showing that what we call the 300 development dividend, a 300% development dividend from improving uh, governance. Essentially, we find on average, and with our data methodology, but also applying the approaches from other scholars that have written paper that, we find that on, on average, a country that improves uh, governance dimensions like rule of law, control of corruption, and so on, by one standard deviation, and I'll, I'll illustrate that, that is associated with a threefold increase in per capita income for that country in the long term. It takes a long time until all the fruits of that reform, of that improvement in rule of law and control of corruption comes. So it's a long run result at 300%. But 300% is enormous. It's a country that today has $10,000 per capita income. In the longer term, you can expect $30,000 by improving this. Uh, in, in, in these dimensions in, in governance. They, this is a causal link. And we, we have provided an approach and a technique to, to suggest that it is a causal, causal uh, result going from improving governance to higher incomes and not in the reverse. It's, it's a whole debate whether the reverse applies or not, but aside from that debate, we show it in that in the direction from better governance to, to a higher impact. We're showing it also in terms of reduction of infant mortality, higher literacy rate, and, uh, and, and, and so on. And this is controlling for other factors. This shows in a very simplistic fashion that type of uh, linkage. But the, the importance doesn't stop at, at such an aggregate level and only income. So one looks, for instance, at the World Economic Forum, which every year rank, ranks countries in terms of their global competitiveness. Uh, they basically run countries after, after doing their, their survey of enterprises and other factors that they include. They rank 139 countries. Uh, Turkey, you may know, on, not uh, Turkey in the last um, rating ranked number 61 out of 139. You would know much better because of the discussion of the glass being half full or half empty, but it's 61. A key pillar in terms of our ranking is the quality of governance or the quality of institutions, where, in fact, in that pillar, it's well below even that average 61. It's the 88, so it's basically below the middle of the, of the pack in terms of of, of 60, 61, while on, on other areas, innovation, sophistication factor, and also market size, for instance, and so on, it's well above, and that's how the 61 comes about. So it does suggest, in fact, among all the main pillars that, that they look at, that institutions is, is very, very important. And in fact, if we look at this link, we see this is quite telling, I suggest to you that very least. We take our governance indicator, let's say rule of law, 2009, and we map it in a plot program for the whole world against a completely separate indicator that the World Economic Forum does for the Global Competitive Index. We see, first of all, that there's an incredibly high correlation, even though those are two different data sets in this point of point 0.85. And that, and Turkey is near the line. And here, here, here it, it is, and uh, around where basically Brazil is in their, in their respects, and much better than many other countries in the world, but obviously there are 60 or so other countries that are, are above it on, on, uh, on the competitive, competitive side. So this is issue of competitiveness. Another area where governance matters enormously is in public finances, and I know some of you work on that issue. And one piece of research 
uh, I, I was embarking recently is in asking the following question. You see, in so many years of the World Bank, I had to focus, and I was very committed to focus on, on the problem of governance and corruption in developing countries. But once I, I graduated from the World Bank and I moved to Brookings Institution, the wonderful thing about being in a think tank is that I can worry and research those issues about any country in the world. So I asked the question, A, what about a richer world in terms of corruption? Is it an issue in industrialized countries? And B, if so, does it matter? So we knew about development, and we showed a 300% good governance, they didn't answer. But what about the rich world? And it was, to be perfectly frank, it was very surprising, even to me, although I had done so much in critical work, how much variance there is in some governance dimensions within the richer world. So even if one just looks at OECD countries, and they, <coughs> basically the, the original set of OECD countries, it was a very close link. And I did some regression with a bit of causality tests and so on, showing a clear link between the extent to which a country is successful in controlling corruption, on the one hand, and the macroeconomics fiscal balance on, on the other hand. And this was at the time of the Greek crisis. So the Wall Street Journal put a big article in the first place with the issue on Greece very prominently here and uh, with, with, uh, with, with the issues, as opposed to the Finnians, the Denmark, and the Sweden, and so on. So, I mean, there are many mechanisms by which this <coughs> uh, is suggested to work with, from tax uh, mobilization to they, they basically that, 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 is, that is lacking and so on, and the links to corruption and so on. But the bottom line is that the, the whole issue of some of these macroeconomic crises cannot be looked only in terms of economic factors driving it. So the whole issue of the political economy and, and corruption issue come, comes in. We'll revisit that before I end with, with an example about the uh, the, the U.S., but let me suggest quickly before that, that one, with this data one can also not only ask questions about what's happening at a point in time, but also what's been happening over time. So, so far, the analysis and the presentation has been um, at the point in, in time. But one, since we have data from the late 90s, one can already uh, do quite a bit of analysis for over a dozen, or about a dozen uh, years. Um, always, this is again generated from the web itself. It's a copy and paste. Always, by default, the top, the top bar for any dimension will be the most recent data point. So, on the bottom, you choose which one we want. So, you want part of the possible in terms of of the excuse that one finds sometimes that only the very rich countries can eventually afford to have good governance. As if the causality direction goes the other way around and income are going to solve the problem of governance. Well, not so. In fact, in Chile, we are still an emerging economy, not very high per capita income, but it, it is already three times higher than it was 20 years ago. So we are. We're seeing the fruits of, of, of that. We have, a, we exhibit much higher levels of governance than a number of uh, countries in Europe, uh, uh, for, for instance. Here's another way of seeing changes over time. And because we have the margins of error, we can also do the analysis. When is a change meaningful or significant in a statistical sense, and when it is not? In these type of writings, and not only this, but too often, there's too much elevator economics. A minor change from last year is blown out of proportion and, uh, and overinterpreted. Because we know what the uncertainty is, the margin of error, we can say is this significant or not. So, so for instance, on voice and democratic accountability, Turkey is positive between 98 and 2008, say that that dozen years. It's positive, but it's in the yellow area because it's not large enough to be considered significant. 
as opposed to what happened in Indonesia, Sierra Leone, and Serbia, or in the wrong direction in the Thailands, Venezuela, Madagascar, and Zimbabwe. So one can also do this type of analysis over time. But because it's already a dozen years, it's not all trends asking the question whether things went either up or down. There are countries with reversal in either direction. So, uh, for instance, okay, in the case of jo uh, government effectiveness, the quality of government effectiveness, in the case of Georgia, it's a steady in improvement. In the case of Zimbabwe, it's a steady deterioration. In the case of Af Afghanistan, goes up at first and then it's deterioration. So one can also analyze trends where they are, they are uh, uh, reversed. The, this type of approach, an empirical analysis, allows as I hinted already, to go well beyond just analyzing corruption. So the whole issue of voice, democratic accountability, freedom of the press, human rights, is also a part of, of the set and part of the analysis. Here, this is a, the world map in terms of voice and democratic accountability. Uh, <coughs> there are, one can go at the individual data set, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but one of the one of the drawbacks of dealing at such an aggregate level with our worldwide governance indicators, which are aggregate, there are only six indicators, is that one cannot drill down and, and ask much more specific questions in terms of, of, a, of a data set. Well, what's the component of human rights in voice and democratic accountability, for instance? Well, in the web, we can drill down and go to the disaggregated data source. So we're the first in saying, don't just stay up in the cloud at the aggregate level. You're interested in one country and want to do more analysis in the website, in the country of interest, you can generate all the individual disaggregated data that we use to generate the aggregate. So here there's one, one such individual data set for human rights where we see, just trust me, uh, that the trends worldwide have been quite mixed. So we cannot claim enormous successes overall. Just like in governance, the trends have been very mixed. Some countries have improved, others have deteriorated. It's a lot have been in the modern middle with some reversal. So on average, we do not see over the past 12 years a major improvement on many of these dimensions of governance. Take you were talking about voice, democratic accountability. Let's take one disaggregated data. Let's press freedom in the world, according to freedom, the Freedom House, which is one of, one of our sources. If we look at the world, basically, in, in the 90s, <coughs> on the left, on the late 2000s, and so now we have 2009, it hasn't changed, but I need to, to update this slide. We see basically the same pie. One third, one third, and one third. One third of the world has full press freedoms, relatively speaking. One third has only partial press freedoms, and one third no press freedoms at all. So it's not, you know, we always tend to claim success that countries have been growing, and in other areas, in technology, obviously, there have been major progress. But on some of these uh, governance areas, that's not, not uh, the case. And this matters. If we link, press freedoms with control of corruption. Obviously, where there is more sunshine and these issues of transparency and press freedom are very important for control of corruption. So, um, so the, these issues are matter and that's why it's important to, to link them together. More recently, obviously, we're all being very concerned and worried what's happening in the core region of the Middle East, um, where many experts, we. I wrote a bit about that, where I summarize what the great experts on ma many of the Middle East were writing, right at the time that Tunisia demonstrations were happening, then Tunisia government force, uh, the number of articles in the most prominent publication, Time, Newsweek, by the main expert, foreign policy and so on, suggesting no domino effect can take place after Tunisia and certainly not Egypt, and giving all the reasons why Egypt and all the other countries are different. Of course, every country is different. But I was at the time focused, of course, in our indicators, and I look at the data. I'm not a great expert on every country in the Middle East, but I look at the data, and I notice that with the exception 
of Turkey, in fact, in basically almost and West Bank and Gaza, interestingly enough, um, almost every other country in the region had not only had a very challenged level in terms of democratic governance deficit, but it had gone very much in the wrong direction during the whole past decade, which I didn't see mentioned in, in many places. Everybody knew that the levels were bad, but almost everywhere. And it's not look, each, Egypt and Tunisia quite, in terms of statistically, it's a tie. They were very similar, and in both cases, more in the right direction. By, by the way, the top one again, the very dark one, is late at the end, towards the end of the decade, and the yellow is uh, the beginning of the decade. So even just paying more attention to the data, not that it's a perfect predictor, but it could have informed some of these uh, pundits, as we call it, and policy analysts that would write very long pieces without a single piece of data. We, I, you can tell, I'm biased towards the power of, of, um, of, of, of data. In fact, at the time, also, we were very concerned about the issue of foreign aid and so on. We, being in Washington, that's an important subject. So I also showed in one of these articles this very simple graph that drew quite a bit of debate and comment. Voice and democratic accountability, Egypt ranked very, very low forever. And not only that, but going downhill. All through the period, development aid, and I'm not talking even about military aid, just development aid from the development, official development donor community, total, US, Europe, and so on, just increasing uh, enormously. So they, I think they, they, the data, at least, and, and just showing it simply sometimes puts policy questions to the fore in, in very This leads to the last uh, part that I want to talk about before getting to just some um, some concluding points for discussion. And that's the P word. And uh, I know that some of you know much more than I do about the P word. But basically, remember I mentioned the C word. In the World Bank, we could not write the C word and spell it out completely, like, which was corruption, so we would call it the, the C. In, by my late years at the World Bank, and still until today, it's the P word, because politics. Okay? Um, so I'll, I won't have a full-fledged analysis of this, but let me just um, show the interface with empirics in one dimension of politics, where politics and high-level corruption basically uh, meet. And that's what, uh, what we have called with my colleague, a uh, former colleague and, and former academic, Joel Hellman, state capture. So essentially, forever, the work on, on corruption, in terms of writings of corruption and, uh, and in the world of corruption, has focused on bureaucratic or administrative or relatively petty forms of corruption, which are much easier to, to measure and to write about, paying for those licenses. They were, the, the graph I had shown early on with the table from Ukraine and Russia. But those are raw hanging fruits. That's relatively easy to do. That does not mean that those are the most important forms of corruption. The grand corruption, and one particular form that we try to get at with a specialized survey, and that's what's shown here for the former socialist countries, is about the extent of state capture. Essentially, it is basically the, the purchase and undue influence by the elite private of the private sector, by the corporate elite, of the rules of the game that govern them. It's a, the illegal bribes or undue influence or other means to shape the policies, the regulations, and the laws of the state for the benefit of, of the few. When an oligarch basically manages to get a complete monopoly or a, basically acquire the whole industry um, by <laughs> through, through their own influence and, and, and money. And we, um, and this is one example, we did it by, by asking in terms of the 
purchase of influence or parliamentary legis legislation, the increase central banking influence, other forms too. This is in the in the late 90s, by the, by the way. And we found very interesting. It's not that everything is under enormous capture. There were some countries in transition that were undergoing enormous capture, the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Azerbaijans, and so on, many in the former Soviet Union, while the more Eastern and Central European, by and large, were going through a more competitive and uh, uh, approach towards a market uh, um, economy. And we found this uh, other graphs are not going to show, but we found that this matters enormously for the growth of the private sector in terms of the rate of growth. Corporate elite, the financial industrial conglomerates and so on, can unduly influence the the decrease the laws, regulations and policies for their own benefit through legal or illegal campaign financing or through other means, through their basically political contacts and political power. So we also had that type of dimension of the more subtle, what we call sometimes legal corruption uh, or, or, or state capture. Whoops, we, get, we got a completely different picture. This is mid 2000s and we find that about 70% say that's the case in the United States. I still remember around that time during the Bush era and so on, when presenting these results, everybody would tell me that these corporations which are answering this are, must be totally lying, must be totally wrong. Once the, the Wall Street financial crisis and global financial crisis hit, nobody uh, says that they were lying and not reporting right, but it was very interesting. And again, the North has come out much lower, although it's an issue and so on, so there were very significant differences. In fact, the US was among all the richer countries, the, world, right? the only one that would compete with the US was, was Italy and so on. So even Europe in general was less than in, in, the, in the US, and the ones who were above the US a bit were the Russians and so on, the ones that you could, you could expect. So, it, these I wanted to, to share with you here today because I know that you are in the interface so between economics and politics and to suggest that, that uh, these issues of data power and measurement and working with technocratic issues like, like at the micro level and on firms and so on is not just important to us the traditional economic and financial questions but one can get quite a bit of mileage by asking about some of these political governance and related dimensions. Um, in some, then, um, you, you have heard it also just very quickly the issue of, of variation is very important in governance and corruption issues around the world, around, uh, uh, between countries, institutions. This, the fact that these variance is a gold mine for us uh, researchers, obviously. Corruption is not in itself the fundamental driver of all ills, and that's why it's important to look at it in this broader governance uh, uh, context. So understanding governance weaknesses is very important. It matters for development, but also it matters for some financial system worldwide. We show it with a, with a public finance link before Greece and so on, and we saw it now on the financial side with the capture in the United States. And, and related. So these issues of governance mattering is well beyond a development problem alone. The importance of transparency is something that, as, as you know, I, I, I stress to be transparent and precise about imprecision in the data. The good news is that there are methods to be precise about imprecision. Therefore, one can make inferences and distinguish between what one, one can infer and interpret and what cannot. And uh, then the last two thoughts on this is the importance of the what we call the demand side of governance, basically the voice and democratic accountability. Not only the, the public sector government institutions issue, often uh, good governance, particularly in the old days in the World Bank and other such institutions, good governance is good government. But that's not, it's not just about the public sector institutions about voice, democratic accountability, human rights, <coughs> civil society, NGOs, and, and so on. 
And this is not unrelated to the last one we just saw, which is taking the, the P word much more seriously in terms of the metrics and, and, and looking at these issues, which are kind of unconventional, but increasingly important, I believe, like, like state, state capture. Let me stop here. This, when I said that if something cannot be measured, then one cannot do something about it, that doesn't come from me, but from the inventor of the measurement of temperature, which was Lord Kelvin, and then last somebody infinitely smarter than myself and many others, Einstein, it put all this in perspective by saying that not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. So one has to keep also metrics in perspective. Not everything can be put in metrics, and I acknowledge that. Thank you.